So thank you everybody for joining us. I'll start again from the top. Now we're uh, now we're live on Facebook as well. Laura, we met um, we met when you were first organising the Love Wine Festival. I was general manager at Hotel Duvan, um, and um, and we hosted a couple of champagne dinners together. We then worked together uh, on the Midlands Wine Spirit Association as a uh, a wine educator. You know all about wine, but um, you've really got some specialist subjects as well, haven't you? Um, I do. Lucky enough to be involved with um, Bordeaux, Champagne, Rioja, specifically. Those those are my main three. I'm going to I'm going to take the opportunity to get as much information from you on the bargains of Bordeaux, Champagne, Rioja today, because I know everyone will be keen to to hear about these. Now, um, in 2010, you were the UK Champagne ambassador. So let's talk about Champagne first of all. What did that actually involve? Um, actually, quite a lot of stressful work. Um, you've put um, in, in the questions that you were going to ask me that it sounded like a lot of fun. Um, I thought it might be fun. It was actually quite a lot of work. You had to do um, some exams, um, tests online and write an essay. I hadn't written an essay for years um, on a given subject and if you were one of the top three in the country in the way you performed in in those questions and uh, in that exam uh, you were lucky enough to go to the Dorchester which sounds lovely but you had to present three champagnes to people who knew way more about champagne than I did somebody like Gérard Basset who you will know well, yeah. well, from the Hotel du Vin, lovely, charming, delightful guy, and um, people from the Champagne Bureau in France and from the Champagne Bureau in the UK and a whole host of other um, wine aficionados, as I say, who knew way more than I did. And I had to teach them about champagne. It was nerve wracking. And I have to say, I sat outside the room before I went in thinking, why am I putting myself through this stress? Anyway, I... The very first year they did this uh, Champagne Ambassador competition, um, I entered and, uh, and didn't win. Um, and then they did it every single year, but you had to be free for a whole week in October. And generally it was around uh, the time of the um, school half term. So I didn't, I didn't um, apply again for years, but the next time I did 2010, um, I won. And you can only, once you've won, you can't enter again. But you then go on, to the same competition but much worse in champagne itself you have a oh, wonderful wow. week uh, going around lots of vineyards and drinking nothing but champagne for a whole week which was not arduous i have to say uh, but again you had a uh, blind tasting blind presentation in front of judges from every european country who'd entered that was massively stressful but you know if you don't do these things, you've got to, you know, sometimes push yourself a little bit. And uh, so then I held the title for that year. But actually, you have it forever. I was Champagne Ambassador for 2010. You can't enter again. So, so lots of deep breaths during that process. Yes, yes. <laughs> and also drinking too. Do you know, at the end of that week in Champagne, the other uh, contestants... Uh, from the other countries, especially the the guys, were absolutely desperate for a glass of red wine. I was fine. Just give me another glass of fizz, I'd be fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I must say, I've, I've experienced that. If, I, if, if I've been on a bit of a, you know, a champagne house visit, and we've been doing champagne all weekend, I do crave that that glass of red wine. Yeah, um, I know lots. Of you've obviously got a great constitution for it, which is why you're the 2010 uh, champagne ambassador for the UK. Indeed. So we've, we've got a really interesting relationship in the UK with, with the Champagne region, haven't we? We're big consumers of Champagne. Uh, it, yeah. Does that influence how you're received when you go over there as the UK Champagne Ambassador? <laughs> I wish. Um, not particularly. We, we are one of their most important markets, um, that's true. We, it's been dropping a little bit, so guys, you know what you need to do. Drink more Champagne. Um, but we tend to drink in the UK brute, you know, the brute non-vintage, as opposed to um, like they do in the States where they'll, they'll spend a little bit more and drink a little bit more of, of uh, vintage champagne. Our sales in the UK of rosé 
uh, champagne are going up and um, rightly so the, the quality of rosé champagne has also gone up so it's not a surprise that the, the sales in the UK have, have gone up too. I haven't noticed that I've been treated better than I would if I was champagne if I wasn't champagne ambassador but actually I'm always really well treated so maybe it is an influence <laughs> so people in Champagne are, are very happy to see um, visitors with the big houses it's generally a good idea to to book in advance yeah and if you haven't been to Champagne and, and been to the cellars you have haven't you Tony I have yeah, yeah 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 they are really really worth a visit and I've really enjoyed going to you know spend some time with a small producer where you actually get to you know, chat with a winemaker, but equally I really enjoyed going to Perrier Jouet and Mum. Um, it, I, indeed, I it's, been... it's a really good idea to do both. Um, on a trip that um, I took some uh, friends over to, to Champagne and we did the big house, a couple of big houses, and then um, at the end of the day we went to a individual producer, a small producer. He sold some of his grapes to Verve Clicquot, but he also made his own champagne and we sat in his kitchen really yeah. and um my friend who loves her champagne picked up her glass and just could not drink another mouthful i'd been spitting all day because i'd been driving <laughs> so i was fine but she just we'd done so much that she just could not uh, drink that champagne but she bought some so she had it at home instead yeah uh, good good so okay now you're you are um a decanter retail awards judge yeah firstly what does what does that mean laura um, so Decanter do um, awards for wines, but now they also do awards for retailers. And so retailers um, submit their applications and they're actually very long drawn out application forms with video links and all sorts of things. And um, I, along with there's five other judges, we decide who we think has performed particularly well um, that for that year this year is going to be interesting because obviously their application is going to involve how they've coped with the current situation mm -hmm. um so it's i felt really honored to be asked to be on the team i think one of the reasons that they asked me to to be on the judging team is because they didn't want all the judges to be london centric so there's a judge from scotland and, and i'm the brummy judge i can't imagine us being better represented so that's good news. <laughs> So, okay, tapping into some of that, um, into that knowledge then, and thinking about champagne, we want to encourage people to, to drink more champagne. Um, what would you recommend? What are some, what are some uh, good buys from the supermarket? Um, my, I think there's a few of my uh, wine people um, in this chat just now they know what my favorite champagne is for everyday drinking yeah. apparently not everybody has an everyday champagne but i do <laughs> and it is uh, the verve Montsigny from aldi okay um which i started buying it when it was about i think it was 9.99 i think it's now 12.49 but i really love it because it's got a little bit of um mature wines reserve wines in, in there so it makes it quite uh, complex actually and quite yeasty and bready and i absolutely love it um also tesco finest premier crew whenever i've done wine tastings in fact tony i'm sure we did one at hotel duval we did yeah. and we did this blind tasting for you know people to enjoy and it wasn't trying to catch anybody out it was just to see what people liked and they voted the Tesco finest Premier Cru over Dom Perignon, and I can't remember what vintage Brilliant. Dom Perignon was. So that's a really good one. I also really like, um, actually, Waitrose um, Blonde de Noir is very good, and also the co-op um, Les Pionniers. Those are my favorite supermarket uh, champagnes. Okay. And, great value. Well, and, and I, love the, I love the Aldi. Uh, well, I'm not going to. I'm not even going to say it because you said it so much better. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, the Morsini, is it? Yeah. 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 So yeah, I think it's a, a fantastic drop. A, a, amazing value. Even even though it adds a pound every year, it's still it's still great value. Yes, too. And, and do you think selling champagne at that price has really just been to try and counteract that loss of market share to Prosecco? Um, I, I'm fairly sure the way that the reason that Aldi are doing it is is to get um footfall 
into the shop and to get people like me to go into and you to go in to buy that champagne and then whilst we're there we'll be buying other things they're doing it as a, a loss leader i'm okay i'm pretty sure about that yeah um i don't think um other places are doing a dropping price i don't think the prices are actually dropping but um we can buy uh, good value champagne these days. And I don't think it is to counteract uh, Prosecco. For me, there is no comparison between Prosecco and champagne. Um, if you want a Prosecco, really easy drink, low alcohol, quaffing, a little bit sweet, go for that. If you want something that's gonna match with food, that's a little bit more robust, more acidity, more complexity, then you've got to pay for it and, and get champagne. Where, where does Cremont sit in that then? Cremont, I do um, enjoy. Um, they are different because they're different grape varieties depending mm -hmm. on where they're grown. So, for example, Cremont de Bourgogne is going to be Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, but if it's a Cremont from the Loire, it will be um, Chenin Blanc, possibly, or Cabernet Franc. Cremont de Bordeaux is going to be Sauvignon, Semillon, mm -hmm. or some red grapes. So, they will vary. A lot of them will be good value, um, especially the ones from, from Burgundy. They don't age generally the same way as champagne will. They may be, you know, good quality champagne will give you just a little bit more um, complexity and depth of flavour, in my opinion. Yeah, brilliant. So now, um, bargains aside then, what is your favourite champagne? I love Charles Heidsick champagnes. Mm -hmm. all of them yeah the the entry level which i think is around 35 to 40 pounds and that might sound a lot but there is this idea that there is value for money whatever the price point and for me that's value for money the wine is so good that it's it's worth every penny and their top wine is just amazing and it's not as expensive as um cristal or dom perignon so i absolutely love that i love tattinger's uh, comte de champagne because it's a blonde de blanc yeah. um but i so rarely have those because they're like in for a hundred quid <laughs> yeah. they're definitely well, not everyday wines i've had a question pop up here do you think that um some champagnes trade on brand and marketing eg i'm not fan i'm not a fan of moet so uh, that that's a question that's uh, just popped up uh, here um yes i would say they they do because they have they they have um they have to spend on their marketing mm -hmm. but what i have found with houses in recent years especially the grand mark people like merton chandon merton chandon actually has really stepped up in recent years it's vintage champagnes are fantastic yeah. and actually you know good value um so a lot of the grand marks i find are much better um in quality than they were 15 20 years ago yeah. um they have a reputation to um not necessarily build on but certainly maintain and so the quality of the what's in the bottle has got to be there so, and the, in fact, most of what, I think it's something like 88% of what we buy in the UK is from champagne houses. We don't buy a lot of, um, it's probably more than that actually, we don't buy a lot of grower champagnes, uh, smaller, smaller houses, smaller individual producers. Yeah, super. So now, um, IWC, what, what is that? We see the initials on the, the bottles quite often. That's yeah. something you've been involved with as well. Yeah, so International Wine Challenge, I've been a judge there for um, many years. I'm a senior wine judge, that's nothing to do with age, although I'm growing into that <laughs> label quite well. Um, it just, um, it's a, a level, there's a, a chairman, then there's a senior judge, then there's a judge, then an associate judge. So we have a team of um, judges that will judge a flight of wines, and during the day you might taste up to 100 wines. It's the biggest international wine competition uh, obviously i judge for it so i think it's one of the best it's very rigorous each wine gets tasted i think it must be at least four times um and obviously it's not um that the label that they get or not as the case may be 
isn't just one person's opinion it is yeah. there is, there are a team of us and then it's judged in the second week as to what that label will be and then it's verified by another team of judges so it is a rigorous process and so if you see that um on a wine bottle and in fact verve monseny the champagne from aldi it got a silver medal that means it's over scored over 90 points so i think they're definitely worth looking out for yeah now when you when you try that do you know the price point that it sits within yeah. at the time um no we don't actually we know obviously we don't see what the wines are they're all covered the bottles are covered you do get to know what country they come from what area they come from a great blend roughly and vintage that's pretty much all yeah. you get so price point doesn't come into it no okay all right good good so definitely worth looking out if you see that on a, a label yeah it's not just one person's opinion. There are going to be a number of people. Exactly. The, the whole Robert Parker thing, you know, everyone obsessed with Robert Parker's scores, but he has a very particular wine style that he likes, doesn't he? Absolutely. So that's great if you like his style, but you could end up with something that you find really... Yeah, it's not your to your bag. taste. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. Now, another competition that you've recently judged in was the Bordeaux Hot 50. Yeah. That's very recent, wasn't it? Um, yes, just before, lo literally just before lockdown, I remember um, when we all met to to judge for that, we weren't sure whether we should be kissing, shaking hands or, you know. <laughs> we were in that moment. It, it, it just started, so it's very recent. And the Bordeaux Hot 50, it used to be everyday Bordeaux when we used to do 100, now we're doing um, 50 of all the different styles, so not just red, but um, wonderful Bordeaux whites, they are amazing. Uh, Cremant the sparkling wines and rosé as well and they all represent good value when we're judging for that again we don't know what the wine is we don't see what the the label on the bottle but we do know the price point yeah. um, and what the Bordeaux Hot 50 is and you can find them all um, online if you just google Bordeaux Hot 50 you'll, you'll find them they again all represent what we think of value for money um, I think they retail, all retail under £25, 20 or 25 and different pr price points, so sort of 6 7 up, up to 10 12 15 that kind of thing, but all good, what we think of as good value. Yeah, yeah, great, thank you. So now um, Marina and Brett have asked, if you see, you know, if a 100 point wine is released on somebody's judging system, Yeah. Uh, is that worth, is that any any greater worth um as an investment or do you or, or you know yeah does it make a difference on the on the long-term price of that wine or are you actually just paying a bit more and you'd be better off getting a 95 percent wine and spending half as much no? um it's very rare that you come across a hundred point wine and they're, they're very very few and far between mm -hmm. um <clears throat> I don't I think I've only ever scored a, a wine 100 points maybe once or twice um, but basically a high scoring wine it will make a difference depending on who scored it if I've scored it no one's going to pay any attention but if somebody like Robert Parker has yeah. then obviously that is going to make a difference to the price or somebody like um, Tim Atkin or um, some of the you know big names I mean there are some wine writers that won't ever score a wine mm -hmm. and the reason that the the price will go up on that wine is um, simply because people will have bought it when it was scored that hundred uh, point and um, and then as the years go by and more and more people drink those wines there's few of them available so obviously the price goes up it's up in sort of supply and demand Okay, but I, this this idea of investment uh, wine it's it's a tricky one really isn't it wine is for drinking and I mean I am as guilty as the next person I have some wine in my cellar that I bought at a certain price because it was a you know I could afford to drink it and yeah. then suddenly because it's got older and there's few of those wines available my wine has suddenly become very expensive and then I think it's too expensive to drink but it hasn't mm. changed actually yeah, yeah. from two years ago so it's a real shame this this idea of investment in wine but um it is it is a thing I, it's going to be interesting what what is going to happen because obviously bordeaux was very much 
uh, at the forefront of people investing in in wine but en primeur is changing that's when people would buy uh, before the wine was actually available and of course this year it hasn't happened because of um, the pandemic so it is really going to be interesting what what happens in the future yeah. with with en primeur and, and investment wine generally we hope we will get back to some normality don't we well uh, yes. you know in, even if it's in a year or something the thought that we might always have to socially distance is a is a frightening thought but let's well, let's put that in a box for a moment and yeah and uh, and assume that you know life will get back to uh, some form of normality can i just drink to that yeah let's do that <laughs> well that's very topical so i was just going to say we're now on to bordeaux uh, I, I've got two on the go here. I'm, not, I'm glad to see. I, I was a little bit worried that you didn't have a glass there. So, what, what are you drinking tonight, Laura? I'm drinking. I brought the wrong bottle. Uh, the other bottle's yeah. in the um, in the kitchen. I'm drinking Chateau de Catillon, uh, 2015, which is a um, Haute Medoc um, yeah. Cru Bourgeois, which I got from Aldi. <laughs> Great. Oh, good. Uh, do, you, do you know what? People watching this and listening to it will be, be really pleased to hear that Laura Clay, wine educator, Bordeaux, Hot 50 judge, is, is buying wine from Aldi. You know, it's, it's, wine doesn't have to be elitist. No. Nope. You know, you, it's you for everybody. You it, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and um, I know that, uh, what have we got? Um, we've got Richard and Joe. They've got um, a bottle of Sainsbury's Taste of Difference Bordeaux Rosé that they're drinking at the moment. I mean, what a night to pick for it. I, I, Absolutely. I, I, I'd already planned what I was going to drink tonight, and then I thought the thought of a rosé when the sunshine came out today, I thought, oh, amazing. Do you know, I can't, uh, I can't remember if that particular rosé has made the Hot 50 this year. It yep. certainly has in the past, and I just, I, I didn't um, check all the wines uh, for this year, but yeah. um, it certainly has been in, in the top 50 before. I mean, my, I, I love um, rosé. I'm definitely not a snob about rosé i absolutely love it and i don't just love it on nights like this i think it works i think it just depends what you're eating and, and yeah, yeah. what your mood is mm -hmm. um so i drink rosé all year round um actually my favorite bordeaux rosé is one that you'll know it or oh, certainly one of my favorites uh, I know what you're say, yeah Bordeaux. yeah gavin quinney's rosé which i absolutely love and again it's not um not expensive and um i guess the taste the difference rosé is a six pounds seven pounds i don't know if richard and um joe can i think it's about that. i think it's about eight eight pounds mark eight, yeah and i think gavin's is about 10 or 11. Yeah. um but yeah that lovely pale fruity strawberry fresh um crispness to it yeah ideal and of course you can order wine online from gavin quinney from you can from bordeaux uh they'll send it over to you, you can get you know mixed uh you know mixed palette of all sorts of different you can get the rose uh, do you know i absolutely love uh l'etoile hectare their um single Semillon. vineyard but yeah, yeah. Oh, superb superb yeah. and of course that is the house wine of gordon ramsay's restaurant sold it in hotel de van for many years and really is amazing value isn't it it is yeah and now the, i've and got the, some yeah. sorry lauren and the sauvignon blanc yeah yeah yeah, yeah. now i've got um i've got uh, a bottle of La Croix. I, I picked this. I picked this up when we were on our travels in France. La Lande de Pomerol, um, and it's Chateau Le Motte. And you thought this was perhaps their second wine? Is that, is that right? Um, uh, no, um, I actually don't know the the wine. I think it's um, called uh, La, La Croix de La Motte. I don't think it's the second wine. Um, the problem is. <laughs> that Lamotte is a name that you find all over Bordeaux. It's, uh, there's uh, Chateau Lamotte Bergeron, there's Chateau Lamotte Suzac, there's Chateau Lamotte des Eaux, there's Chateau yours, uh, La Croix de Lamotte. Um, it mean, it's, it's a name for a start yeah. It also means moat. So it's like a moat oh, around the chateau. And obviously in Bordeaux, it's all about um, chateaus. And your particular one, I, I don't know, but obviously I can tell you a little bit you can tell me what it tastes like, but I'm assuming that it's very high um, Merlot, possibly yep. even 100%. Um, 
um, <clears throat> right bank wine, Lalonde de Pomerol, no reflection on you at all, but poor man's Pomerol, if you like. Oh, <laughs> um, well, I've got a poor man's Pomerol. Arguably, I've got a poor man's Centimillion Grand Cru here because I've got a, I've got a little Grand Cru oh, in my other glass. The Centimillion Grand Cru from Lidl is brilliant, I think. It's I mean, that, that's great value, isn't it? Is that, is that around a tenner still? 10 or 11 pounds? Yeah, 11 pounds, yeah. yeah. It's really good. I remember going into a little once and um, <clears throat> following a couple in front of me, um, their trolley was absolutely bursting at the seams with saint million Grand Cru. Yeah. They were Chinese ethnicity, and I'm absolutely convinced they were buying it for a restaurant. Yeah, but probably. Table. But, but it, it um, is a really... Oh. It is actually, the, the difference between the two wines, I think we played... A similar amount for the other one in France, and this is, you know, it just goes on and on. The finish is uh, is great on it. What vintage is your um, Saint Emilion Grand Cru? Say that again. What's it, what vintage is the Saint Emilion Grand Cru? It's very young, it's 2017. Okay. Yeah. And your La Croix is 2016. 16. So 16 was a brilliant, brilliant year. Yeah. It was just fantastic, um, and uh, actually all over. Uh, Bordeaux. 17 not quite so um, as exciting but 16 was really delicious and and um, wines with a lot of power so potential for aging. If you've got more of it you can keep it. Yeah yeah well look, some other people are telling us what they're drinking at the moment so uh, Doug and Hila are drinking a Diablo dark red that our son bought us from Sainsbury's. Deepest punt ever Laura will understand. <laughs> Wine is average, bit fruity but won't last long. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, Warwick and Joe are drinking Jeff Cohn, uh, Botticelli, Zinfandel. And I, I, well, I, I could have guessed that they would be drinking Zinfandel. Uh, sure. Warwick and Joanne, you will uh, you'd appreciate that I would expect that and expect nothing less. And our next door neighbours, because we've got a fence panel missing between our gardens, they're drinking what we're drinking tonight as well. <laughs> Very, we like to uh, socially distance but share the experience. So, so that's good. Okay, so now we've talked a bit, Centimillion, Pomerol, they are both right bank wines. Yep. For some people listening, they know exactly what that means. We could be speaking double Dutch to somebody else. So tell us a little bit about Bordeaux and what that means when you're talking about left bank wines and right bank. And of course, you guessed that that would be heavily Merlot. I'll, I'll hand over to you. Um, well, Bordeaux is one appellation but it actually isn't divided into 65, actually, different appellations. But when we talk about left bank and right bank, it's specifically uh, the right bank of uh, the Dordogne and the left bank of the Gironde Estuary. And the, the soil types are different. So the grapes um, that are grown in the two different areas um, are, you know, that, that makes it relevant. So Merlot suits the soils of the right bank and Cabernet Sauvignon suits the soils of the um, left bank. Um, you've got more gravel on the left bank, which helps to ripen the Cabernet Sauvignon. In the right bank where you are, you've got Merlot, but you've also got Cabernet Franc and a little bit of Cabernet Sauvignon as well. And in the left bank, we've got those with some other great varieties as well. Um, those are our three main great varieties in Bordeaux, but you also have Petit Eldor, but also people don't realise Malbec and Carbonair that are also Bordeaux great varieties originally. And they are still planted there, but they represent a tiny um, amount of what's grown in the area. Thank you for that. Now, Kenny's drinking Antonio Sousa's L'Oreal Vino Verde, and it's warm in Gloucestershire. I'm not surprised that Ken is drinking... Uh, Avina Verde. He's um he's a Portuguese specialist. Ah. <laughs> well, cheers, cheers to everybody. Thanks for sharing your drinks with us. Cheers, so cheers. It's not just about red wine in Bordeaux, though, of course. No. And there is some exceptional value to be had from the white wines of Bordeaux. Absolutely. Um, I have to say that for me, Bordeaux whites are some of the most underrated white wines in the world, both for value and quality. Um, the grape variety for the fresh, easy drinking uh, wines are, so is Sauvignon Blanc. But when it's blended with Semillons, potentially having a little bit of oak aging, they are just 
phenomenal, really exquisite, complex and um, elegant wines. And I've just got to share with you, I noticed, and I tweeted this today or yesterday, um, that Waitrose are selling Dult, which are really fantastic negociant, um, Rock Blanche um, white Bordeaux for $6.99. It's an absolute steal. So rush out and buy that one. The other one that I buy from uh, Waitrose is Chateau de Crusoe. Um, that's quite often on offer. I like my bargains. Uh, quite often on offer. It's normally $17.99, but when it's on offer at $13.99, it's worth buying caseloads. Yeah, yeah. So I've got a, a comment popped up there from uh, Marina and Brett. Um, what areas around Bordeaux are, are also worth looking out for? They've, they've been to Duras and love the wine there. And of course, that is the what we call the Southwest, isn't it, in France? Yeah. So which, which areas to visit? So if you go to, to um, Bordeaux, I mean, it's a, Bordeaux is a UNESCO heritage site. Saint-Emilion is a UNESCO heritage site. And that's definitely, definitely oh. worth a visit. Mm -hmm. you, have you been, Tony? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's so um, historic, it's cobbled streets, it's so picturesque and, uh, and beautiful to, to drive around. And then if you go, uh, that's obviously the right bank, and then if you go over to the Medoc, the left bank, it's not quite so impressive in terms of the scenery other than for the chateaus, which are amazing. Yeah. So, and Bordeaux town itself, you know, 30 years ago was, was a bit of a dump. It's not anymore. It's, it's, it's a city really worth uh, visiting. Yeah. Um, and if you go to, um, well, lots of different places, but south of Bordeaux, the Grave, which is the, the, the area that first established um, vineyards from Roman times, there's beautiful areas to cycle, there's golf, there's all sorts of things you can do. And obviously it's right by the sea, and if you go down towards Alcachon, there's the biggest sand dune in Europe, Pilar. It's a really wonderful okay. place to go and, and visit. And then, of course, if you're going over in that direction, um, we're getting towards Saturn, aren't we? So south of, um, south of um, Bordeaux, you, you will find Sauternes and the sweet wines. I can't believe I haven't mentioned the sweet wines. They're heavenly. They're just delicious and and the best sweet wines in the world bar none and talking about those bargains if you keep going towards Bergerac and uh Montbaziac is uh incredible yes. value isn't it by comparison yes so Montbaziac isn't um I, they are good value wines and they are good quality they don't have quite the um Generally, I'm generalising here, the, the richness or the longevity that Sauternes yes. has, but you're not paying the same sorts of prices no, either. But yes, I agree, Montbazayac are lovely. So why does Bordeaux have such legendary status? You know, the Bordeaux blend, we talked about the grapes that go in that earlier. It's replicated around the world. Why? How has that happened? Um, a lot to do with, obviously, history. Um, Bordeaux where it's situated right on the Atlantic, the so great big, uh, the Giron Destry, you can actually get great big ships into docking right outside the city of uh, Bordeaux. So actually trade, um, the fact that it traded with Europe and with the USA, that meant that the wines were known all around the world. Historically, obviously, it was um, English at one point when uh, Eleanor of Aquitaine wow. married uh, Henry Plantagenet. So there's a link there and a lot of um scots scottish people english people irish people went out to uh, bordeaux so there's been a link for a long time the the reason that the wines are um so that's why they're so well known but also the quality is um so high because we've got two of the top red grapes in the world cabernet and merlot and particularly cabernet sauvignon it marginally ripens in bordeaux when everything's perfect it is just sublime but it's tricky it's not um you know you don't find cabernet sauvignon planted further north than, than bordeaux and where you find grapes that ripen marginally only just manage to ripen in the area that they grow they tend to produce 
the most exciting grapes. So people have tried to emulate that around the world. So Napa Valley and um, Kunawara and even in New Zealand and Chile in the Maipo Valley. South Africa as well. South Africa too and South Africa of course have their own. They do Bordeaux blends but they also do their Cape blend which means it's got to have some Pinotage in too. But it's you know Pinotage with Bordeaux and Merlot, um, sorry Cabernet Merlot etc. So where do you think out of all those regions do it best outside of Bordeaux? Um, that's an interesting one. It's actually, it's developing. I, that's the wonderful thing about wine. It's always changing. It's always developing. So the wines of um, the Napa generally, you know, 10 years ago wouldn't have been wines that I drank. They were really ripe. They were very alcoholic. They were very expensive. They're still expensive, but they're not quite as... Um, uh, as rich and heavy as they as they used to be and there are just some amazing not necessarily Bordeaux blends but Cabernet Sauvignons I'm thinking particularly of um, Corazon who makes arguably European style uh, mm -hmm. that's certainly what she's aiming for um, Cabernet Sauvignon the thing is it's a hundred pounds a bottle yeah so I Bordeaux has that reputation for being so expensive you know what why why is that is it just demand you know, it's interesting. I just heard on a webinar that I was on earlier today by a Californian guy, and he was saying years and years ago, um, maybe in the 60s and 70s, you could buy, he actually quoted this, a 1945 um, Chateau Lafitte, so a first growth, and you'd be paying $35. Yeah. So prices just went a bit crazy when so many people came onto the market and then they went up again when we had a, a new um, impact of consumers from the Chinese market and that did make prices soar because too many people around the world want those wines that's that's the issue yeah I mean this, you have the same thing in Burgundy too yeah, of yeah. course but it is a it's kind of a misconception that you can't get I mean we you know you, you this Centimillion Grand Cru from Lidl is, is a really great example that you can have an everyday priced wine that is sensational. Actually, That's thank you for reminding me to say this is really important, that these very expensive Bordeaux wines, they represent 2% of what Bordeaux produces. Wow, 2%. So the rest is affordable depending on your budget, obviously, what, your, um, what you decide your everyday uh, wine budget is but say under 20 pounds you will get a lot of uh, good quality Bordeaux wine. Thank you both. Exactly. So, now you mentioned Burgundy as well um, that Grand Cru classification now it is it is slightly different classific how it works in Burgundy and Bordeaux what are the key differences yeah. in, between those well, two regions in that respect? In, well it's it's not only different uh, Bordeaux to Burgundy it's actually different within Bordeaux so you've got okay the um, left bank classification that was formed in um, 1855 and doesn't change and it's only on 61 chateau and then you've got the right bank saint emilion grand cru class a classification that does change and then you've got a, a cru bourgeois it's, it's what, what i'm drinking that changes in the past it used to change every 10 years and then it went to it annually and now it's to every five years so uh, they are based on the um, producer and the, and the vineyard, whereas in um, Burgundy, it's on the vineyard itself and, and the vineyard might have, will, will likely have many, many different owners. Okay. So each with a yeah. you know, few vineyards. And so, so that, that Burgundy way of doing things is more common across France then? Um, yes. And, um, you know, in... in uh, Bordeaux we have this classification so we have the appellation of the Medoc the Haute Medoc and then communes but within those you are the wines are classified whereas in Burgundy it is on the 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 land you know the the, the vineyard itself so Grand Cru Premier Cru. I tell you what it's hard to imagine how these new world countries managed to steal so much of the market by being by telling you what was on the label isn't it after yes, all these absolutely. complicated rules you know well exactly. interestingly i've noticed that um on bottles of 
Bordeaux Blanc, I am seeing Sauvignon Blanc on the label, which I never saw before. No, so... Is that my um, imagination, or is that uh, that's happening? Oh, no, that is happening. And um, in the past, it, they couldn't do it. Um, they weren't allowed to put the grape variety on, except Alsace, uh -huh. um, which obviously always labelled by grape variety, but other areas didn't. And also, there was never any need to, because... I always take Chablis as an example because it is one grape variety. It can only be that one grape variety. Everybody knows what Chablis tastes like and what they're expecting if you if you buy a bottle of uh, of Chablis. They didn't need to put the grape variety on the label. Obviously, the New World countries did because a bottle of white wine from I don't know Yara Yara, you know that people didn't know what to expect from yeah. what was in that bottle. Um, so they so they put grape varieties on, and now in Bordeaux, they do put um, grape varieties on just for an understanding. We don't have a lot of white different grapes in Bordeaux. It's Sauvignon, Semillon, Muscadel, a couple of others, mm -hmm. um, but yeah. And also, Sauvignon Blanc originated in Bordeaux. The people from the Loire won't have that, but the Bordeaux yeah, sure. claim claim it as theirs. Um, and, it's the um, moment, isn't it? So people want to yeah. capitalise on that from a, a sales perspective. Yeah. And I just remember um, actually Gavin Quinney of Chateau Bouduc asking me if I would ask a, a wine group how he should label his white. Should he label it the appellation of Entre de Mer um, or Sauvignon Blanc? And I said, absolutely totally or Bordeaux Blanc yeah. and and I just said well I know what everyone's going to say and of the 60 59 said Sauvignon Blanc because we understand what that means yeah and you gave an example of Chablis there but how many people have you come across doing your tastings that say I don't like Chardonnay but I love Chablis you know exactly so, you know it's kind of case in point really and and it's made the European wine world really think about what they're doing and how they're marketing their product I guess as well. yeah indeed Okay, so, I mean, we're, we're um, how important is the age of Bordeaux? Um, aging, the, the wines of Bordeaux? Yeah. Um, it depends on the vintage. So it depends um, on the, um, the year that the grapes were grown as to how they are going to mature. Also, it depends on your palate. So if you're like Robert Parker and you like a really full, fruity fruit bomb, and um, then you're more likely to want to drink that wine younger. If you're a bit like me and like it a little bit more subdued, um, then you like your wines more aged. There is no one aging um, advice I can give <clears throat> because it will depend on the wine and it will also depend on the, uh, the year. So certain wines are going to age better than others. For example, 2013 isn't gonna age very well. 2016 that your drinking is going to age really well okay it depends well, but i always say this though to my um wine groups yeah i absolutely cannot remember where i got this um snippet of information but apparently 95 percent of what we buy in the uk is consumed within two weeks yeah. so not many people are laying wines down do you know, I thought this fact was even, I thought it was shorter than that. It's open within six hours of purchase or something. Oh, well, yeah, you're right. It's 98% in, in two weeks and 95 in two hours, something yeah, like that. Yeah. yeah. Nobody's. I, I don't know nobody if that's just is. Birmingham and Solihull. I, I don't <laughs> know. <laughs> so, um, I, now I do know that uh, Birmingham is the Sauvignon Blanc capital of the UK, according to Lathwaite. Right. A high percentage. It, when they compare all the different towns they distribute to, um, a high percentage of Sauvignon Blanc consumed than anything else in uh, in Birmingham. Oh well, all those consumers need to try some Bordeaux Sauvignon because it is lovely and it is, it's 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 much lighter than say a New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. It's more sort of elderflower and not quite so punchy, more delicate. Now, um, time is getting on, and I, I've not even talked to you about Rioja yet. But at this moment, we're going to take a little break for Tony's 20 questions. I'm a bit nervous. The moment you've really been looking forward to, Laura, I'm sure. <laughs> so uh, because, uh, you're, you're too nice for me to do these questions too horribly, uh, as I did to Phil. So I've been a little bit easier. But um, so here we go. I'm going to ask you 20 questions. You've got two minutes. And you're going to give me one answer out of the two options. Okay. 
no messing about, no umming and erring. You've got to go straight, straight on the nose. Initial response. So here we go. Here's your 20 questions. Chardonnay or Sauvignon Blanc? Chardonnay. Fine dining or steak and chips? Fine dining. Oaked or unoaked? Oaked. Apple or Android? Apple. Bordeaux or Burgundy? Bordeaux. Bordeaux or Rioja? Oh no! <laughs> Bordeaux. Left bank or right bank? This is hard, left bank. Cremont or Carver? Carver. Ooh. Rugby or football? Rugby. Le Pan or Petrus? Le Pan. Cristal or Dom Perignon? Dom Perignon. Aldi or Lidl? Aldi. Regular wine or natural wine? Regular. Faustino or Kuhn Rioja? Kuning. New World or Old World? Old World. Laurent Perrier or Perrier Jouet? Laurent Perrier. Stilton or Roquefort? Roquefort. Port or Sherry? Sherry. That's like every sommelier's answer, by the way, is it? Or anyone in the wine industry. Uh, Joe Exotic or Carol Baskin? Oh, God. <laughs> Carol. Chateau Lafitte Rothschild or Chateau Latour? Latour. And I'm going to give you question 21 because I'm horrible. Uh, Loki or Connolly's? <laughs> I'm going to go Connor Loki. Hey! <laughs> Fantastic. And I'm letting you off the hook there like I wouldn't do to anyone else. So uh, you're a good sport, Laura. Thank you very much for that. Oh, the thanks for the questions. They were brilliant. Okay, good, good. Okay. Now, um, so Rioja, like Bordeaux, another legendary wine region. How might you sum up Rioja as a region or a wine style? Um, wine style, um, it's oaky, mm -hmm. seductive actually quite easy to easier than Bordeaux to appreciate either in its young stage you know if it's made in a young style and also in its Grand Reserve more age style it's it's just kind of um it has its complexity but it doesn't have bitterness ten, it just tends to be really easy uh, and I don't mean that in a negative way I mean that in a just a smooth way generally a bit more approachable yeah so you mentioned it there with the aging of the wine. You know, I think there is a misconception. We talked about people thinking that Chablis and Chardonnay are, diff are different grapes, for example. I think there's a misconception a bit around Grand Reserva and that Grand Reserva is definitely always the best wine. And actually, it's more about what happens to the wine during the production. And of course, Grand yeah. Reserva's wines tend not to be poor wines or, you know, you wouldn't do that with a, with a cheap wine. But mm. can you sort of shed a bit of, a bit of light onto that for, for people listening? Well, that's always how that they have in the past kind of graded their wine. So you would only put your best grapes in wines that are going to mature for a long time. And the Grand Reserva is basically an age qualification. So it has to be in barrel for a certain length of time. It has to be in bottle for a certain length of time. It has to be matured um, in total for five years, for example, Grand Reserva. Um, but now there's this... Um, rebellion really of people that want to make great wines but don't necessarily want to do all that aging they don't want to put their wines in barrel for 24 months which is the minimum legal requirement for Grand Reserva and the I'm really impressed actually with the the DOCA the, the appellation have actually come around quite quickly to including these um, producers by giving them this a new category if you like um singular vines singular uh, i speak french don't speak spanish very well <laughs> and um they they have a very pre precise criteria the vine vineyards have to be 35 years they have the vines have to be um, grapes have to be hand harvested all sorts of uh, requirements to make sure that the wine is still of a really, really good quality, but they don't have to be Grand Reserva, but they will still be deemed to be very high quality. They've changed quite a few things, actually. They're now allowed to produce sparkling wine um, in Rioja under the Rioja 
name. So you could make sparkling wine in Rioja, but you'd have to call it Carva, and very few okay. people did. Um, I mean, I don't know, 95% of sparkling wine in um, um, Spain comes from, Car from, comes from Catalonia. But mm -hmm. now in Rioja, you can have a sparkling Rioja and call it a sparkling Rioja. So okay. they have made some interesting adjustments to uh, their rules and regulations and uh, appellations and classifications. And that overhaul is, is quite recent, isn't it? Last couple of years? Yeah, indeed. So we've probably yet to see the fruits of that, those changes, uh, I, aren't we? Yeah, so, well, it, they, they are coming um, into the UK and um, real Rioja specialists will definitely be, be selling um, some. Um, the thing, the thing with Rioja is, it's a, it's a wine that is very highly thought of in the UK. We, we understand it, I think. Although, of course, there's white Rioja, there's, um, there's rosé Rioja as well, but we think of it as a red wine. We know it as a um, oaked wine. We may not know the grape varieties. I always think what actually the grape varieties in the bottle doesn't matter. It's actually what the wine mm -hmm. tastes like. Um, the grape variety is Tempranillo, the main grape variety. But again, things are changing a little bit because um, people are not necessarily discovering new grape varieties, but there are some mutations that are coming through, like uh, Tempranillo Blanco, so white Tempranillo. Yeah, I'll try um, that. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and some interesting producers are trying some of the old indigenous grape varieties as single varieties um, in their bottles. They can still be called Rioja, if it, as long right. as it's a grape variety that is permitted in the area. So, um, Maturana, for example. And, but a great variety that I think is really exciting is Graciano. It accounts for 1.7% of what is planted in Rioja, but it has a lot of acidity and age potential. So it's used quite a lot in Grand Reservas. But because of climate change, it's very helpful for um, maintaining acidity in the blend when the grapes might have less acidity with warmer temperatures yeah. so it's going you know that's going to change and garnacha which was always kind of undervalued again is people are looking at um, at that great variety as a in a better light yeah personally i, I love garnacha i love yeah. chespicos is one of my uh, favorite uh, spanish reds uh, really so it's, it's a really juicy grape isn't right. it and it's yeah very accessible and yeah, yeah. Easy to drink. yeah. so i like it too does, yeah how much does Garnacha represent it within Rioja? Um, it's about 11%. Oh, really? Growing, but um, yeah. So where it's key is in Navarra. Yeah. Um, and also in Priorat, it's uh, the great variety for oh, Priorat. Another wine. sensational wine, yeah. 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 Now, um, Paul and Sheila are drinking a Baronia Reserva 2014. Nice. Opened a Rioja because they uh, knew you were coming on this evening. Um, I think it's about 16 quid in Waitrose. Yeah. Um, I, I hope you guys uh, are enjoying that. They've got a question. Should a decent Rioja be decanted? And if so, for how long? Um, <clears throat> I think it's always good to decant wines, especially wines that have been um, in bottle for a little while, which a Rioja always has, uh, certainly a Reserva and Grand Reserva. Um, <clears throat> You know, you decant for several reasons. One of them is to remove the sediment, but the second is to let the wine have contact with the air. And if you think about it being stuck in that bottle, it really opens up. I'm sure you all know this yourselves when you have it in your glass and if you don't knock it back immediately, as you're sipping it, you'll notice that there are more and more aromas coming up through the evening so I think it's always worth it doesn't have to be a posh decanter it can be just a jug but it's just giving it um, a bit of uh, a chance to express itself yeah and therefore give you more pleasure now Paul and Sheila they um, they tried a Kune Monopole unoaked um, white Rioja Viura grapes didn't like it but they really liked Lopez de Haro Malvasia and Viura, three months in oak. Yep. So knowing the, the difference in style of those two wines, are, are there any other white Riocas on the market that you could recommend? Oh, 
Um, so I think the Lopez, the slightly oaked one is from Majestic, I think, isn't it? And it's definitely one that I have really enjoyed. And I do like, um, as I said in your 20 questions, I love oaky wines. And <clears throat> the cheaper Rioca, white Riocas, if you over oak them, they're, they're just not going to carry uh, that oak. But just three months is just enough to give a little bit of um, creamy and um, smoky flavours. Can I think about, well, do, what was the other one that they weren't so keen on, the Kune? They didn't really like the um, Kune Monopol. Right, okay, because that was one I was going to suggest, um, <laughs> even though it's un -oaked. Um Tondonia make um, absolutely amazing uh, white Riochas, but they are expensive. And I can't think of a cheapy one. Oh, I tell you who did do one, uh, the Wine Society. And I'm just going to have a quick look at something that your readers might find interesting. Um, this is, as chairman of the Association of Wine Educators, um, I have uh, set up Emma, this... you dropped, I heard that clang there when you dropped that name, Laura. <laughs> um, only I'm in my last year. But I, I organised this last, this brochure that I think is now in its fifth or sixth year, where we do um, great value wines from um, different retailers and I'm sure somebody put, if it wasn't this year, it was last year, uh, one of the Wine Society White Riochas. Cune do a barrel fermented White Rioja according to this from the co-op at £9.50. And I can't I'll tell you what Laura, why don't you, when we post this up on, on Facebook as like an edited video, be yeah. quite, you know, if you, if you give me any top tips, maybe we'll choose some Riochas, some Champagnes, um, some Bordeaux and we'll post Laura's top tips on online as well. Perfect. Now I'm um, thinking further afield but still but still within Spain um, I mean I, I love Galicia, uh, I, I love Albarino, I even like some of the other varietal wines that are, be, that are coming out of that oh, region. Did you now. visit? Sorry? Did you have a little visit? I did have a little visit yeah it was brilliant yeah. yeah, yeah. It was great. <laughs> I think you went just before, just after I'd gone. Yeah, yeah, oh, we're really well looked after. And, you know, we, we are so lucky working, you know, in and around wine that we get to see some of these places, taste some of these wines and actually get to meet the people within their own wineries. It is, it is amazing how um, vineyards tend to be grown in some of the most beautiful places in the world. <laughs> and Galicia is definitely one of those, I agree. It's, it's, actually... it's just not what you would expect from Spain, is it? They call it green Spain because it's lush it's beautiful it looks more like english uh, countryside almost yeah. than, than it does you know the, so if unspoiled. you go to the coast it's craggy rocks with atlantic ocean yeah. smashing into the uh, in, into the coastline so you know it's not that kind of parasol and beach ball no. cold and sand spain that we always think of but uh, now i wasn't actually going to mention um, um, you know albarino land as i call it but, but you know R ribera del duero and uh, navarra what, what how, how do you see those regions and how do they compare with Rioja? Um, Navarra, um, so Garnacha, natural um, home for Garnacha. Um, so more um, easy drinking uh, wines. And again, I'm generalising and, and they're great on their rosés too. Ribera del Duero, um, I don't know why people don't buy these wines more often. They are stunning. They it's Tempranillo is the grape. They, they also are allowed to add some Cabernet and, and Merlot. This is quite um, elevated um, vineyards uh, at high level and um, quite cold, or well, very cold in the winter and very hot in the summer. So you get um, really ripe grapes, but thick skinned and they're really robust wines. Yeah. I find them um, really exciting and that the best one is some of the most expensive wines from Spain are from Ribera del Duero. Very different from Rioja, even though same grape, both aged in oak, but completely different wines. Do you know, Laura, one of my favourites is the Celeste from, um, from Waitrose, which is a Ribera del Duero wine, which is incredible. It's so silky, full bodied. You know, I would definitely recommend that. I've used that in tastings and everyone loves it as well. Yeah. Oh, good. And they tend to have a freshness to them as well as being really robust. No white wines in Ribera del Duero, they not like okay. Rioja. I'm just thinking that Celeste, which is named after Starry Night because they have the, the clear, you know, cloudless sky at night where you can see all the stars. And that's a, it's actually a Torres wine. Oh, right. 
Torres, brilliant producers. Yeah, we, I've had a sensational wine dinner with those guys at uh, Hotel de Van. It was really, really good. And we, we actually tried some of their other ranges that you wouldn't have known were Torres. Mm. Uh, brilliant. Now, uh, Ken has uh, said he, he's done a bit of research for you. And uh, it's a Kune barrel fermented Viura co-op. Now 1040, but it used to be £8.50. So, uh, so maybe that's one to try. And uh, Paul and Sheila, I know there's a co-op not too far from you. Uh, maybe, maybe one to choose. Well, listen, we're, we've, we're, we're up for an hour now, but really I could have talked to you for an hour on Rioja, an hour on Champagne or an hour on Bordeaux. And I, I know my Solihull wine crew, we'd love to have you at Solihull Wine Club one month or something. To, to oh, I'd love to come. Session on one of those. I definitely think we should do a dinner one night as well. Um, I look forward to catching up with you when we get to uh, the other side of this horrible kind of lockdown stuff that's going on. Yeah, you too. But Laura, thank you so much uh, for, for joining us tonight. It's always an absolute pleasure to chat to you. It feels like we've only been talking 20 minutes, but that's always what happens when, uh, when I'm talking to you. So thank you so much for your time this evening. Thank you, Tony. It's been lovely to chat.